Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. I mean, where else are you going to see someone play this much of the video game industry? Let's see where we left off. It is 1981. We're at the very end of 1981. And before we kick off all the releases that were released at some point in 1981, I'd like to showcase this magazine, the first issue of Electronic Games. It is the magazine that I would say is the quintessential magazine for our show. It is the first ever magazine that is incorporating everything. We're talking handhelds, consoles, computers, arcade. It has everything in here, I guess, from a North American perspective. But this is the very first issue and the winter issue of 1981 for Electronic Games. So let's check it out and see what is up with that. This one has a lot of good stuff in it, uh, a lot of things we've seen before, and there's even some some things that I didn't even know it existed, and the, the magazine explained stuff that I had to look up myself to find. So uh, here we go, the Player's Guide to Programmable Video Games. So if you were in 1981 and you were a big gamer, this would be uh, your Nintendo Power, because it is for me. This is like uh, the ultimate in 1981 right here in one magazine. Look at that, video games, computer games, standalone, arcade games, it's all in this magazine. And there, here's some of the articles they're going to have. Can, can asteroids conquer space invaders? Who who would have thought of bringing that up? Um, is that even a topic that some people were thinking about in 81? Then we have the attack of chess robots inside the TRS-80 color computer. The space invaders and breakout tricks to win. And then touchdown with the coach of electronic football. And then we even have holiday gift giving for gamers. So we're really diving in. And this is what 1981 was really like to see what you could buy during the holiday season. And here we go. We starting off first with an ad by Atari, all the others, and they have Space Invaders and all the others in Missile Command and all the others in Atari Warlords and all the others in Atari Asteroids. And we've seen all these on the show. And yeah, there it is. Atari, there's no comparing it with any other video game. Only Atari makes the games <laughs> that the world wants. And for 1981, that was true. It is, uh, Atari is on top. Arcade, uh, I wouldn't say home computer, but uh, they have a really good uh, footing in the home computer range. But uh, arcade and console, definitely. All right, so as we scroll down, yeah, it's the same that we saw there. For table of contents, we're actually going to breeze by this because we'll be sh uh, showcasing the entire magazine during this episode. So uh, reason by that, and next one is that we have an ad for the monster movie Crush, Crumble, and Chomp, which we saw on the Apple II because we could find a release for it. And there is uh, two others that we're going to see, the TRS-80 and the Atari's uh, home computer version. So we will see those. I remember when we booted that, we didn't know the commands for the monster because it's not what you think. You don't get to control around Godzilla on the screen and not, not like action style. It's more strategy. But we'll be checking out that, playing some more of that, because we'll, we'll have a manual to know what to, commands to give them uh, animals. So, Crush, Crumble, and Chomp. At your dealer, by Epics. Another big publisher. And here we go, the beginning of Electronic Games. So, this is giving you the debut of what they are, what they're about. Uh, senior editor is Frank Laney Jr., and uh, they even give you a little history. Although first the, the first Pong machine made this to be only a decade ago, they're saying more than 5 million Americans regularly play electronic games. So right now, this has given us some stats about what 1981 is. And it's funny because they're looking back at the history and saying just a decade is a big deal you know, that Pong came out. So we have the Space Age Electronic Amusement amounts to nothing that, but an entertainment revolution, and it was. So right now, they're saying that nearly 4 million homes have programmable video game systems. In this year alone, 1981, Americans will buy 2 million video game systems and 20 million cartridges to use with them. And they say games pour about 10 million quarters into Asteroids coin-operated machines every single day. Whether or not you believe those stats or not, it's pretty impressive. And now the hobby's reaching new heights, and so this magazine is for all of the big gamers in 1981. And uh, w whether your flavor, because uh, this is for everybody. And they're uh, breaking down their staff and what their promise is. Like they want to make sure that everybody that tunes into this issue or all the issues th that they're, they're giving you real reviews and not just from people that are been, been paid for that. And of course, that's what most magazines claimed at the time. If you're familiar with um, Electronic Gaming Monthly and PC Gamer and so forth, they always want to give you that impression that this is this is no one's uh, giving us money for our reviews. We're giving you real reviews because we're real gamers. And so, again, take that with a grain of salt. So after we do the intro, uh, by the way, Electronic Games was a uh, a branch of another game called Play. And we can see up here in the title, 
uh, if you look in the on the cover, it says. Uh, oh, sorry, that play, Video Magazine. So they had a, ma a magazine created right before this that was about uh, just the television. And uh, they talked about television shows and, and entertainment. And they started to have columns on video games. And it became so popular that they just made their own magazine. And here it is. This is it. Electronic Games. Our next one is an ad for Bridge Players. I don't know how big you would find Bridge. Uh, for me, not interesting at all to have an electronic Bridge game. But if, if you enjoy Bridge, this this is what you want in 1981, I guess. And where you can buy it in 1981, too. And after that, we go to uh, Writing In. These aren't super interesting. Uh, a, lot, a lot of this is just, you know, congratulations. We got our own magazine. That's so cool. Um... Yeah, so it's talking about uh, the, the the gamers are writing in and just expressing how uh, amazing this is. So we'll, we'll, we'll breeze by that part. But uh, going on to our next one, this is an ad for Activision's a tennis. Uh, t tennis for Activision was uh, pretty standard. It was cool to see that it wasn't using a pixel uh, for the characters or uh, like kind of like Pong. And we started to see, see the beginning of drawing ca characters in as playing tennis instead of just a Pong clone. So it was cool. It, I, I'd say average for the time. Activision Tennis, we, we already checked that one out. And then here is the classic uh, commercial with George Plimpton. Atari versus Intellivision. Which one's better? You decide. I mean, look at this. That's a, a home run on Atari. Oh, it looks just not as good as Intellivision. It looks more like the real game, right? Yeah, there he is. George Plimpton telling us which one we should buy. And I got to admit, Intellivision does look better. We've seen um, a, a few games that didn't play as well. Because Atari was pick up and play just like an arcade. So I guess if you have the flavor of wanting something more detailed, and television is for you. But after in, uh, Atari got the Space Invaders game, that was their killer app. And then there was no turning back. And there was more uh, Atari 2600 systems than uh, in television by uh, a large margin. All right, so that is basically the a really good ad for Intellivision. And the first time that someone's taken a jab at someone else in the video game industry. Yeah, the real sports line was pretty cool. Yeah, the 2600. Yeah, it hasn't been there yet. I think, it, I think it's 82 or 83. But uh, we will get those for sure. All right, here we go. We got some inside gaming. This is their section about uh, getting the inside story of how a video game started off. So this time they picked David Crane and using his game Freeway, which we've played before. It's a... Uh, kind of a rendition of a game we played called Space uh, uh, Spacewalk, where you're just trying to move your a ship across without getting hit by a an asteroid. And he just turns it into a chicken, and you're trying to dodge the car. So this is like, how did he think of the idea for Freeway? And so David Crane, hey, there he is. Much happier now. We saw on the back of the, uh, the, the manual for Freeway and Fishing Derby and a lot of the ones he made for Activision. He wasn't too happy to be here, but now he looks a lot happier. So the story of Freeway begins at a trade show where they had to accidentally let the convention center the wrong exit. And the only way they had to get across was crossing the Windy, Windy City's busy thoroughfare at the height of mid-afternoon crush. So he had the idea to, okay, let's make a video game where you have to cross traffic. And this is interesting to me because this came out about the same time as Frogger, really close. And so it's it's funny that they both had kind of an idea. Let's get something to cross the road. This one's very simple, though. If you've seen the freeway, it's a chicken just moves straight across to the top. And there's the cartridge in the bottom left corner. Why a chicken? <laughs> so kind of a cool inside look at how the game became a game. And this section is about meeting all the editors. It's uh, Frank Laney Jr., uh, Bill Kunkel, Joyce Worley, Jethro Wright III, and Frank Tetro Jr. And so this is explaining their background and what kind of gamers they are. So we got um, uh, some of the editors are PC gamers. Well, I shouldn't say PC. They don't call it that yet. They just call it computer, computer gamers. Or some of them are handheld gamers. Some of them are console. And so they kind of give them your background so you can see that they, they know their stuff whenever they write articles in the magazine. All right, so this is the Electronic Games Hotline. From here, it has uh, ways that you can get the newest information, and this is your source. Way before the internet, obviously, this is where you would find out about video games. <laughs> yeah, probably. 
All right, so they say sources at Atari confirmed that arcades uh, are using a VCS adventure and performs a specific action. A secret message can reveal the designer's name that will appear on the screen. That's correct. This is the magazine that was telling people about the first Easter egg by Warren Robinette. And uh, they're explaining that they're not going to give you exactly where it is, but uh, Electronic Games uh, did an interview and they're going to plant little Easter eggs in games now that will have tr a real treasure hunt to look for them. And they're not going to tell you exactly where they are, but they're going to tell you that they're there and then that, telling people they can go look for it. There's also an Atari report that McDonald's is going to be doing a fast food chain uh, uh, to, so that uh, uh, McDonald's and Atari are going to work together to have uh, uh, advertising and marketing. And I, I do remember um, uh, uh, McDonald's had uh, toys that they put in with it, but I, I can't remember specifically if it even went through. Uh, so a little uh, uh, a bit of information there. And there it is, the picture of Adventure in the bottom left corner, explaining the Easter egg to everyone else. Kind of a cool idea, but they don't explain it here. They just say there is an Easter egg. And then there's also a delay uh, behind, the, behind the Atari VCS asteroid cartridge. A year ago, there was um, uh, a, a problem with how it came out, and it was uh, 8K versus 4K on the cartridge. Didn't seem possible. And so they came up with a way to get it up to a 4K program for Atari's Asteroids. And then they also have a, a little section here uh, right above my head on Red Baron, which was an arcade game we played. Really cool one um, in the arcades. Wireframe, vector graphics, first person flight game. So cool. And then they have uh, the biggest tournament in the history of electronic gaming is scheduled to begin in Chicago on October 29th. The four-day extravaganza build is the Atari World Championships will award the best players of that company's coin-op games with a, a total of $50,000 in cash and merchandise prices. All the way back in 1981, they already have a tournament. And there it is. Uh, there's last year's tournament that had 10,000 video fanatics, they say. And there's some people playing on CRT televisions for the championship. So that's advertising that. And then uh, last year, apparently, they did a Space Invaders tournament to uh, as championship imagine going to a video game tournament and the game that you're going to be competing against is space invaders amazing and then we also have um for elect uh, electronic uh is this for mattel yeah so this one's for um M mattel uh getting rights to major league baseball and uh, we already saw that on the in television a lot of their games were licensed and then we have, uh, here we go, on. Uh, the, look at the controllers. That's the Mattel and television controller with the flimsy little disc at the bottom. Dave Browning's tackling the Mattel contest winner. So uh, I don't know who it, who's who on the pitcher, but one of them is the Mattel contest winner for Major League Baseball. And then we also have, uh, in the bottom left corner, there, there's, they're, they're going head-to-head, -head. <laughs> battling uh, video games in 1981. And then we also have uh, different hobbies for Dungeons and Dragons. There's a standalone video game, which we haven't seen yet on the channel because I couldn't find the exact release date, but it will be when we showcase the rest of the games released in 1981, the Dungeons and Dragon handheld. If you're familiar with that one, it's, it's pretty cool, impressive for the time. And then over on the right side uh, above my head is the Stampede game that we played, which uh, by Activision, yes, yeah, Steve Cartwright. And then we also have ice hockey, which we've seen already on the channel. And then uh, they talk about the Activision Club and the ma mailing your your scores in to get uh, uh, recognition for it. And there it is. In the bottom left corner is one of the examples of the patches you can get with Laser Blast. If you got the high enough score, they would send you a physical patch. Who put those patches on their clothes, though? Never saw anyone do that. It usually just showed the patch. Like, here it is. Check it out. Like it was a medal or a medallion that you won. And then uh, they go in next to talk about computer upgrades between the Atari 400 and TRS-80 color computer. And they're talking about, you know, a RAM upgrades, uh, getting your computer to go faster. Uh, then we talk about the next section is Cosmos putting on the shelf. Cosmos was um, a holographic uh, handheld. You can see them playing it in the center there. They're saying it possibly will come out next year. It's meant to be a, a, a kind of a, 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 it's not really a hologram. It's a projection to look like it's a hologram, but it's meant to be a handheld system. You can see it's a little bulky on the side there, but Cosmos, we'll look to see that if, if it comes out in 1982. And then um, right above my head is Quest for the Rings. They just gush and gush in electronic games about Quest for the Rings. 
It's the first projected trilogy of board game video game hybrid. And the next one coming up is called Conquest of the World, which I believe we're going to see at some point in 81 is what my sources have told me. If not, it'll be 1982 when we see Conquest of the World, another really big Magnavox Odyssey game like Quest for the Rings. And then they talk about uh, you have Quest for the Rings posters, T-shirts, and Odyssey is uh, doing a lot of advertising and, and really bulking up the support for Quest for the Rings. I was very impressed. Amazing, amazing that a console had that at the time. And then here he goes, an ad for Video Magazine, which is where they first spawned their Electronic Games Magazine. We'll just breeze by that. Not interested in video. We want video games. Okay, the next section is really cool. This is the gift guide for gamers. So all of the moms or people that aren't into video games, maybe they looked into this in 1981 to see what they could buy for all the gamers. So we have um, right here next to my head is a Casio game playing watch. So apparently it's saying it it's a Casio CA90 where you can see on the uh, on the watch it has uh, a full number pad plus minus and then a period and it's saying that it can play games but I'm wondering what kind of games could the wristwatch play it looks like a very uh, fancy calculator really cool for the time though for, uh, a, a Casio watch with all that functionality looks awesome I'd love to see what kind of games it could play it's got to be really simple though and then um, again on the right side we have a Space Invaders jacket. That is a satin Space Invaders jacket, sixty bucks at the time. Uh, got to be better than that silver jacket we saw by Mister Arcade last episode. And then on the left side we have the Fidelity Champion Sensory Challenge. This is a, a chess game that you could play. That um, is, um, it's going to play against you. And when the computer makes the move, you just you have to still move the piece itself. But it's uh, it, it's meant to be. You can use physical pieces to play chess. Pretty cool. Everything else we see here on this magazine in Showcase, if we don't see it in our normal program, this is where we'll see it. So if you uh, uh, reach out to me and say, well, we never, we never saw the um, the handheld wrist, wristwatch game. Well, th this is it. This is the showcase from this magazine. Because some of this stuff is either things we won't be able to play ourselves on the show, or it'll be something that's very obscure and only found in uh, publications like this. Yes, Chase the Chuck Wagon. Maybe for your dog, if your dog had a Christmas list. And then over on the right side, we have Pocket Simon next. Uh, we already talked about Simon from 1979. And here it is, Pocket Simon, just a smaller version of it. That'd be pretty cool for the holidays. On the left side, this is another really big one uh, that I wasn't able to get a, a way for us to showcase or play. It's Merlin by Parker Brothers. They're calling it the single best-selling handheld in the field according to manufacturers, maybe according to Parker Brothers. Merlin is six different games. This is Tic-Tac-Toe, Blackjack, 13, Magic Square, Mindbender, Echo, and Music Machine. And uh, this uh, handheld reminds me of a lot of the games we see on consoles. They mash together multiple games like Logic or Mindbender uh, type, type games into one cartridge. And this is no different. Just for a handheld, it's pretty cool. And then after we scroll a little bit further down, we have on the far left side, Space Invaders t-shirts. If anyone in the chat or in comments had any of these, or uh, if you had the satin jacket, that'd be pretty cool to hear. And then right above my head is the Children's Discovery System. It's learning fun for all the kids out there. It's beginning. Once they get that microchip out there, it's going to go in everything. We're going to see so much. All right, so let's go a little bit lower. We have our more holiday gift guide. Uh, I don't know about home bingo. Maybe for introducing electronics to the elderly. It says it's available for two or 200 people. There you go. Electronic bingo. Eh, I, I'm not uh, a fan. And then over on the far right side, we got Alien Vaders and Galaxian, the mini arcade. Really cool one here. Uh, I think we're going to see this one later on the show, but if not, here it is. This is a Space Invaders uh, or Galaxian handheld that you could play. And then if we go a little bit lower on the left side, this is the head-to-head -head boxing by uh, Coleco. Really popular one for the time. And then on the next side is the Apple Crate, which I don't know familiar with that one is. Computers are looking for a place to put their machine and peripherals. Oh, I see. Where do, where do you put all those peripherals? Where do you put the um, joystick and everything? You just buy an Apple Crate. 50 bucks to put all of those accessories that uh, now no one would care about. But at the time, maybe if you had a lot, but... Um, I, I kind of grew up in a poor family. So, uh, for me to have a lot of extra stuff for my computer, it, it wasn't happening. I was not one of those kids. 
All right, so if we look at the top, this is the horse race analyzer. This is a terrible gift guide. This is uh, a analyzer that is supposed to give you, you you're supposed to put in uh, bets and numbers, and it's going to tell you what is going to be the better one to bet on. So it's not even where you're playing a game. It's just to help you bet. So to help uh, that uncle that has a gambling problem, there you go. Uh, use that one. And then over on the uh, far left side, oh, Mac Daddy Joshua had a Merlin. Awesome. Does it still, do you still have it? And does it still work is another question. So over on the far left side, we got the electronic detective. First electronic augmented board game. It's similar to a non-electronic detection like Clue, and it's capable of creating 130,000 crime variations grilled to each player in turn. Yes and yes. Oh, so cool. That's awesome. All right, so uh, this, is, this is another one that we're not going to see on the, the, the show, so this is it. This is the showcase for the Lexor. It is an electronic version of Scrabble that allows you to play against a computer. And uh, just keep in mind, it's 1981. This is the holiday season for 1981. And th these are really impressive uh, things considering every year uh, we, in 1980, th th this was unheard of. Uh, 79 was the first time we had a handheld that had interchangeable cartridges. And uh, everything just keeps ramping up. We're going to go faster and faster. It's going to be really cool to see everything change as we move on in the, in the channel. All right, so there is our holiday gift guide. If I had any of it, I'd say the Satin Jacket, Space Invader Satin Jacket. That would be the best gift. All right, our next section is Electronic Games talking about Tandy and the Color Computer. Now, it's a little late. Uh, this is when the, co the Coco does take off. But so they're talking about the newest computer by Tandy. It's uh, the predecessor to the TRS-80 Model 1 and 2. Uh, it's interesting they say Model 1 and 2 because the 3 uh, is out by now. And the color computer is um, is not just the TRS-80 uh, with color graphics. It's um, uh, it, it's a different architecture than that. See, it's using CPU keyboard case, enough to provide room for integrating all the peripheral devices. Gone is the cumbersome, expensive expansion module of the Model 1. And that's true. The Model 1 is pretty cumbersome. Oh, same time. Okay, yeah. So I wonder why they only said 1 and 2. And Model 2 didn't really have a lot of games. So uh, on the on the channel, we're going to be playing TRS Model 1 and 3 mostly, but uh, uh, 2 was uh, m mostly business. I didn't find a lot of games for the Model 2. Yeah, and so they're talking about how to hack the games, and then, uh, oh, because um, uh, obviously copying is still a big thing. Yeah, 77, Model 2, and 79. Nice. Okay, so the game they show is Dino War. I couldn't uh, recommend this one more. I'm amazed that this was out whenever it came out. Dino War is so cool. So if you can play Dino War any way you can, do it. It's, uh, it is it is a sight. It's it's awesome. You can see they're talking about how it fills the screen with so much color. And of course, compared to the TRS-80, it, it does. And on the far right side is Pinball, another one we've uh, showcased on the channel. Uh, the, the physics wasn't super good compared to other things we've seen at the time, like Bill Budge's trilogy of games, Pinball. But uh, it allowed you to make your own pinball. And that was the biggest part of, of that one, in my opinion. So as we move down, it's talking about uh, the uh, RAM is 16K. For some reason, computers don't think home computers need very much memory. And maybe that's their opinion, but at the time you you had different uh, models because I think the 32K was available uh, by this time. And you can see they're talking about um, the different uh, interpreter for the color computer, sticking with uh, basic and uh, we're, we're seeing some in machine language. There we go, yeah. 64 and 83, yeah, well, that'll be a while. <laughs> All right, and then moving on to our next section. This is called the Test Lab. And they're going to talk about um, uh, information about the color computer. And you can see here they give us a really sweet computer glossary to help you become acquainted with the, the terms. Auxiliary storage, storage, modem, which uh, I can't imagine modems were super popular at the time. But uh, interpreter's big, uh, RAM, of course, ROM, interface, disk drive, CPU. And uh, so that's really helpful for all the, the, the people that were the, the console only or arcade only gamers. This is more technical. And, and this main this whole uh, magazine is really fun because the other magazines we've seen on the channel, not not to bash Byte or, or um, uh, uh, Analog, but they're, they're, they are very technical magazines. And this one is like a magazine for the gamer. You can see how it's marketed. It's played to like, let's just get to the games and talk about the, the, the game side and not so much 
the details on the system. But here we go. They're giving us uh, specs of the TRS-80 color computer at a glance. And uh, right now, the 4K is 400. 6K is 600 for the color computer. Microprocessor uses 6809. It's got eight colors plus black. And then uh, sound, which we haven't seen too much sound for the Coco, but five octave, 12 note scale. The keyboard uh, is, is, is all right. I've heard the joystick, though. Is, oh, here we go. On the far left side, they say the joysticks are, in a word, lousy. Here, Tandy's attempt to cut corners has totally failed. The response and feel are poor, and they don't automatically return to a neutral position. And it's true. I've seen that with the emulation we've used. The joysticks are also physically small. And there's the example next to the, the, the Coco. Makes them less convenient than the ones that most gamers are familiar with. So interesting comment coming from the magazine in um, the holiday of 1981. And then they should say the programming language that they use for it is basic, but we also have seen machine language. And then uh, games are on ROM, and they're they they, they, to they they're showing the uh, cartridge games because those are the ones that were released when the Coco was released. But we've seen disc and uh, cassette since then. All right, so but it was very expensive to play on disc. All right, so after their cool little Coco section, let's move on to Q&A. And this one is just kind of funny because the questions, I'm pretty sure they're staged, but check it out. They're saying, do video games damage television sets? No, no, uh, video games do not damage television sets. So these questions are hilarious. Atari Star Raiders is my favorite game for the 400 computer. I'd enjoy it a lot more, though, if I could figure out how to make my spaceship dock with a star base for refueling. I followed the instructions to the letter, but nothing happens. Am I doing something wrong, or is my ROM cartridge defective? First of all, they're doing tech support. Like, they're doing game support. I don't think there was a, a, a call um, a company to help you with your Atari game, but here it is. A question on specifically with Star Raiders, which in my opinion is an amazing game for a home computer. Star Raiders is one of the best you could play for the Atari home computer. And so they're saying that the ROM cart's in perfect working order. It's probably because you just didn't understand the game. And they say uh, they're showing you how to get the speed correct and the coordinates correct so you can dock. But if you think Star Raiders is fun, wait until you try incorporating docking. Once you dock that... That ship, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> oh, that's true. They didn't talk. Did they talk about freezing the screen? Worry about the system being on. Back to background colors. Phosphor changing. Worry about damage. The TV set dates back to the infancy of the hobby. Hardwired video games in the past were unaware of the potential difficulty. As a result, many sets wound up with ghostly white line running down the middle of the tube from Pong. And yes, I've heard about that because you know Pong was just what light, uh, or the brown box, or the Odyssey doing that. But it's not a problem with modern systems. So here in 1981, they're saying modern sets shouldn't have a problem da damaging the television set. That's interesting. And then over here, we have a question. How many problems every time I try to load a game cassette into my computer? Sometimes it runs for a while and stops and flashes an error message. What am I, what am I doing wrong? One sure way to lick this problem every time is to first run your tape through an ordinary audio cassette recorder and hit the high pitched squeal of the program's lead in, stop the recorder, rewind the tape a fraction of an inch by hand, reinsert into the cassette loader and try again. That is tech support. 1981, to fix the cassette loading, you play it on a normal cassette recorder and then you manually, remember putting your finger in and then having to wind it? That's, that's their advice to help that, that problem. And this is a cute little mascot. Dr. Cursor says, don't forget, always shut off your control unit before you insert and remove a cartridge. Thanks, Dr. Cursor. And then we have a question. I thought all computer games on cassette were written in BASIC, but Atari Space Invaders loads directly into machine without assistance of BASIC ROM cartridge. How is this possible? How, how, do, how are they doing it without BASIC? Well, of course, it's machine language, right? Yes. There's another kind of speaking the tongue called machine language that's not directly understandable by people. Since Space Invaders is written in machine language, no basic interpreter is needed, and it goes fast. Incidentally, machine language has several advantages over basic. The point of view, they can read a lot faster, speeds up the action, and computer experts are constantly developing new languages. A language called Pascal is being used to write several upcoming new games. First one we saw, I believe, was Wizardry. Uh, on the channel, and then some exciting breakthroughs in the area of graphics. So there you go. Uh, the first time that they had to break down, why is the game not using basic? <laughs> I guess using a pen would be smarter for the cassette tape, right? <laughs> All right, here we go. The next thing we have is an ad for the quest for the rings on our Odyssey 2. Amazing game. Here we go with all the pieces. We got the map, all the tokens, and then they're on the far left side, they're showing you putting the overlay down on your Odyssey system. 
because as they advertise, the keyboard makes it a better game experience. I dig it though. I say five stars for the time. That is uh, up there. And then they even have more info. This is kind of cool. Uh, I want to back up and see the whole whole spread. This is their whole um, like overview or a quick overview of Quest for the Rings, explaining how you use the tokens in the top left corner. And then they show you, like in the manual, an example of what the dragon looks like, a cool uh, artwork of it, and then the pixelized version of what you see in the game. You have wizards, warriors, the tarantulas, the bloodthirst, and an example of all the places you'll go whenever you play the game. So cool for the time. Yeah, I, we don't see as much nowadays, uh, uh, but that's why we have this kind of split between the board game aficionados and the video game lovers, because the, the vi video game usually don't cross paths, unless you consider something like um, Seen It, where it has a board game that you're playing and then you play something on the screen. But uh, yeah, that's true. We don't have a lot. It's If you're playing a, a board game or you're into those kind of things, they go uh, pretty crazy. I'm really a, a big fan of Betrayal at uh, House on the Hill which is a, a much detailed board game to play. And so they're, they're doing that now. They're very complicated, fun board games to play. Similar vein as Dungeons & Dragons, but they don't incorporate as much video part to it. So, but this is it. you got video game and the board game part. And there's the game board map. Love it. Yeah, this one's uh, up there in my book. And then they have an ad for the rest of the Odyssey 2. So for all the Odyssey 2 fans, Quest of the Rings is one of the games. And here we go. Every single one of these, I think we've seen them all so far. Speedway Spinout. Yep, saw that. Cosmic Conflict, Blackjack, Wardeners, Out of This World, Soccer, Hockey, Breakdown. Uh, yeah, everything. we Computer Intro. I don't know if that's even a game. <laughs> But I don't, I don't think we saw that one. Oh, and they have a picture of Conquest of the World here, which means we might see it by uh, it's the release in some time in 1981. So there you go, Odyssey 2, and add for that one. And then next is the strategy session. How do you get better at video games? They're going to give us tips on how to play Space Invaders better. And uh, their tip is as soon as the game begins, slide the mobile cannon to the extreme right and destroy the vertical column. Then zip over to the far left and knock out that column. And then the mothership will appear at the screen and destroy that. This leaves you in a group of this of only 16 space invaders, and then you take them out. Uh, looks like that's an interesting strategy. So there you go. From the pros in 1981 of how to be better at space invaders, and they might know because they went to a tournament for space invaders. And then we have breakout. What's their breakout strategy? It's got to get to the top of the screen, right? Break through and get to the top. Does it say? How to do it. Object here. Destroy multi-layer one brick at a time. Breakouts, a game of strategy, stern test of motor skills, and high and hand-eye coordination. A player can, win, uh, without a definite plan, still score well by keeping the ball bouncing around long enough. Okay, it looks like they continue uh, later with that one. And then next one is... Can Asteroids Conquer Space Invaders? Alright, so they're going to do pitting one against the other. And uh, this is the Atari version. What I'm looking at it appears to be, this looks like the console, the VCS version. And I'd argue that on the, the console, that one is superior for Space Invaders. But in on, on the home computer, Asteroids uh, kills. It, it is definitely better than the VCS version. Okay, so they're going to go through uh, comparing Asteroids and Space Invaders. Which one is better? So it looks like, uh, anyway, Space Invaders came out in 1978, and uh, uh, Taito installed 100,000 Space Invader machines and raked in $600 million, it's stating here in this magazine. The Bank of Japan tripled production of the 100 yen pieces, and the Japanese PTA tried to banish Space Invaders on the theory that it inspired kids to play hooky, and it possibly did. This success led to uh, banning certain systems, it looks like U.S., and it was becoming a fad, becoming a lifestyle, hypnotic progression of the invading aliens, enthralling gamers. One of the first big hits. All right, so can asteroids conquer it? Uh, they talk more about space invaders and the history of space invaders, which is kind of interesting. And it's it's stuff that we've already talked about and familiar before. The uh, Let's see, they say uh, asteroids was already stealing some of the thunder from the older game. Within weeks, the struggle between the two titles for the top spot in commercial arcades began in earnest. Bally Midway had the uh, moneymaker for the home version, and then the result was Galaxian uh, for the Bally, uh, for the Bally uh, Astrocade. 
And then Asteroids differs from Galaxian. It was never intended to be the son of Space Invaders. Of course not. Uh, Galaxian is the, the actual sequel to Space Invaders. And then we uh, break this battle between the two games with an ad by Scott Adams. He's all over the 80, uh, early 80s with his newest adventure, which is Savage Island Part 2 and Golden Voyage for TRS-80, Apple, and Atari. Just 20 bucks for the cassette tape. Not bad. Uh, check in the chat. So, high score girl? No, no. In Japan? No, I've never heard of that one. I'll have to check that one out. In the time that we're in, 1981? That's interesting. So, Galaxian is the souped up space invaders. Asteroids is very different than that. And do they have any successful? Here we go. So, how successful is Asteroids? Since October 1979, Atari's Asteroid uh, has shipped more than 70,000 Asteroid units uh, worldwide. Asteroid's one of the only two coin-op games to have succeeded well enough to justify the second deluxe, uh, Asteroid Deluxe version. And then, uh, oh, here we go. This is just showing the, can Asteroids conquer Space Invaders with both side by side? Asteroids is also one of the longest running hits on the history of commercial arcades. Six months at or near the top of the sales chart is considered excellent. But the game is already starting its third successful year with no end in sight. And I am with you. Asteroids um, lasted a lot longer as popular in the arcades. And here we go. Oh, Netflix. Okay. I'll have to check that out. Asteroids led a coin op games and gross revenue in 1980, pulling as many as 10 million quarters in a day. So that's kind of the stats they're giving us about that. The first arcader who piled up 15,449,950 points was David Janice, uh, who shattered that record with 22 million. Oh my gosh, that is a gamer in 81 that could have that kind of score. How long were they playing? Were they in the arcade for a weekend or something? So at this point, uh, Asteroids is very popular. Then we have Deluxe Asteroids that's released. And then they, they're they more just giving us a history. though. So the article really isn't pitting one against the other. It's kind of hard to compare Space Invaders to Asteroids anyway. And here we got some uh, ads for some really cool t-shirts, man. Yeah, got to check those out. And here we have what's next for Electronic Games. Oh, was that the end, by the way? It was the end. Okay, so the battle ended with, let's call the battle between Asteroids and Space Invaders a draw. Both of them are winners in any gamer's book. Yeah, I think it was just their uh, attempt to give us history about it. Not really pit them against each other. All right, so what's next for electronic games? Uh, this article is about uh, the future or what they imagine the future is. So let's see what they say in 1981 as the future. This is by two of the editors uh, or two of the writers, Bill Kunkel and Frank Laney Jr. And uh, they always say prediction is always risky to say what's going to happen or what's not going to happen. Ordinary consumers can't get past the front gate, but Electronic Games was there to get the low down. And there are numerous video games reaching to the stores for gift giving and flood of new titles are going to slow down this summer. Some of the manufacturers are having trouble keeping up with the booming demand for their existing cartridges. And this is very true for the VCS. It's no secret that the search for popular titles can be challenging. Oh, interesting. They're already saying in 1981, how do you know which games are the good games? Which ones are going to be the Chase the Chuck Wagon and Kool-Aid? Uh, but of course, we haven't seen those yet. The, they'll, they'll be coming out later. But they're already saying how it's it's tricky to decide which one's which. So um, Atari used the Consumer Electronics Show to premiere its remote control VCS. And they're talking about remotely controlling uh, the game. And you can see here, in the bottom left corner, that's some people testing out the wireless Atari VCS at the, the Consumer Electronics Show. Still going on strong now. CES Show, I'd love to attend one of those. The big breakthrough in video game software is the souped-up cartridge, Atari Activision and Odyssey 2, all introducing them soon. They're going to do ROM cartridges for 2K of programming information, is what they say here. Manufacturers begin to equip 2K additional memory and uh, Activision is using this for ice hockey by Alan Miller. Each team uh, has, has both a uh, two players and a, go uh, and a goalie. Both are free skating. One nearest the puck automatically comes in direct contact with it. And we checked that one out, ice hockey. And then they have they talk about fishing derby. 
And then uh, the Odyssey 2 has some interesting games coming out. UFO, Alien Invaders Plus, Monkey Shines, which I think we'll see those for 81. They're released at some point in 81. And then they just gush all over Quest for the Rings. It's the most exciting release. Quest for the Rings, the first Odyssey Master Strategy series. It's the first hybrid board game video game in history. And that is not true. The first hybrid board game video game in history we saw on the Odyssey, the, the first one. They already had hybrid board game video game. If you want to consider two lights on the screen, a video game. And we interrupt this with an ad for beating the price over on the left side. Here's the price of the Commodore VIC-20, the newest by Commodore 260, Atari's home computer, the 400, the lower model is 330, and then the 800 is 780, which I just believe it uh, ups the RAM and the keyboards better. You can see the uh, the different keyboards between the 400 and 800. It's the 800 is more modern uh, keyboard. So, so there you go, price check of computers at the time. And then continuing this article, they talk about the future of uh, Activision. So they bring up a lot of what they're doing to, to, to push forward in the video game industry, what's going to be new. So they they talk about the uh, chess players and increasing the artificial intelligence of games. And we're going to see a lot of that as well. And that's how things look for the balance of this year and the first half of 1982. <laughs> they, even, they even give a preview of Dallas, which is, I think, the text adventure game based on the TV show. Wow, looking forward to that in 1982, right? All right, so within the next 12, 18 months, they say it's entirely up to... Uh, the computer in the family garage putting a final polish on the new electronic game that will top even the wonderful ones already poised to astound arcaders in the year to come. So it's kind of a prediction, but not really what the future is going to hold in 1981. <laughs> yeah, because uh, he, he was the, the bad one. So uh, I guess you would want to play as him, right? Yeah, is that what it says? You can The computer represents JR and is programmed to cheat. Yeah, if you're playing the Dallas uh, game. I guess that's a preview. How do, how do they even know? Maybe, maybe they're just expecting that's what the Dallas game is going to be. All right, so moving on to our next one. This is an ad for the Player's Guide to Programming Video Games. And uh, this is about, uh, I guess, the, the slightly more technical side of it. So it started with Pong. And we give a history of Nolan Bushnell creating the game that eventually took the world by storm. Many hands contributed to the creation of electronic gaming. And the Odyssey made numerous breakthroughs in those early days. Bushnell's vision of a hobby that the entire family could enjoy and share on an equal basis has become the guiding philosophy of electronic arcading. And he's no longer uh, with Atari. He is, I believe, at this time having fun at uh, Chuck E. Cheese. And Ray Kassar is the one that's in charge of Atari right now. So uh, this, th this section is one of the big reasons I wanted to showcase this magazine. And that's the Arcade Awards. This is what this magazine says are, were the best games... <laughs> Uh, that you could play at the time. And I think they go from everywhere. Yeah, they go in different places. So here we go. They call them the Arkies. This is all hardware and software produced prior to January 1st, 1980. So th they're just saying since this is the first issue, everything that came out before January 1st, 1980 uh, is going to be these awards. And then the next issue we see is going to be the awards for just uh, 1981. So th th this is everything that was before 1980. And they say the best Pong variant is Video Olympics, which was one of the launch titles for the Atari VCS. And I could, I could agree with that. Uh, Video Olympics is excellent. There's so many variations of Pong. It's, it, it blows away all those standalone consoles we saw in the 70s. And then the best sports game, they're saying football for the professional arcade or the Astrocade. So... We haven't seen this yet. It's uh, going to be seen at when we play the games at some point in 1981. So w will it be the best football game we've played so far? I, they say so. We'll have to check it out and see. And then they say the best target game is Air Sea Battle for Atari. Eh, I don't know. That's that's a little rough. But I guess it depends on what you say is a target game. Because the, the one on the Apple II, I'd say, would be better. In my opinion. <laughs> and the best SF game. SF, what would SF stand for? Cosmic Conflict. Oh, strategy maybe? Wait, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what they're saying, what the, the best F, SF would be. Strategy f something. Oh, science fiction. Okay, that makes sense. So science fiction game, Cosmic Conflict. So it's a tactical combat triumph. Han Solo into the cockpit of a space fire. Keep firing those space tor torpedoes because there's no shortage of attacking ships. 
for the Odyssey 2. So they're saying the best science fiction game, Cosmic Conflict. It was it was interesting. It, this is the one where you change colors if you uh, tuned in for that one. We also played it on the Philips Video Pack, the European version. It was okay. I don't say it was the best science fiction game. No way. The best science fiction game would be Star Raiders for Atari 400, right? And then we have the best solitaire game, Golf for the Odyssey 2. Groundbreaking, innovative, as much fun as it was today was introduced. Uh, I don't know about that being the best solitaire game uh, to play by yourself. Uh, that's that's a stretch. Then they, they're saying the best innovative game was Basketball by Atari. And uh, they're not saying which one because there was the VCS one and there was the computer one. The computer basketball was fantastic. It was um, definitely one of the best titles you could play at the time, especially if you're a sports, sports fan. So they're giving us a broad view of the entire thing. So now we're going to go on to 1981 and what they say. So they're saying video gaming today, right now where the most arcaders are flipping through this issue of electronic games, some retailers selling the 5 millionth programmable arcade system. Since more than two thirds of machines have been bought only within the last year, it's safe to say that interest in home arcading is rocketing into the stratosphere. No prime attraction has always been programmable. Uh, programmability. It should come as no surprise that sales of the cartridge rising even faster. 15 million game programs were sold in 1981, it says, and a total could mount to more than 20 million this holiday season. And th keep in mind, we're ending 1981. Uh, still going to be in 1981 for a while as we do the other releases at some point in the year. So here we go for 1981. They're saying the game of the year was Superman. The most important release of 1980 Solitaire Masterpiece lets the gamer play Man of Steel to catch Luther and his gang and rebuild the bridge they destroyed. Superman was a really difficult one to pin down, uh, the, the release date. There was lots of places that said one thing, another thing said another. So uh, they're, here they're saying it released in 1980, and I, I enjoyed it. It was, a, it was one of those games like Adventure. How, do you, how did you get Atari to play multiple screens? That's, that's incredible. They said the best target war game was Armored Battle for the Intellivision. And uh, that was pretty good. I still say it looked better, but uh, combat still had more game modes. And well, that's that's that's, that's a tricky one because there are some that played not as good, uh, but then other modes played pretty good in combat. So, but uh, I guess you're saying for '81, yeah, I could say that for in television, sure. Then they say the best Pong variant was volleyball for the Odyssey 2. And if you remember that one, it was the one that uh, we got to play with KC Club Kirby. It had two, it had six people on each side. And you control all six. And you're literally bouncing the ball over the top uh, of the screen. I don't know my best Pong variant, but at that point, uh, Pong's getting a little uh, young in the tooth there. Or old in the tooth, whatever. So best science fiction game, they say, is Space Battle for the Intellivision. Tactical strategy elements, out-of-this-world graphics, alien ships dip, dodge, and fire back. It looks like their uh, awards are only going to consoles. I don't see anything in saying computers. Unless they're talking about maybe the Atari home computer. The next day, the best visual effects is Fishing Derby. <laughs> How about that for an award? The best audio visual effects is Fishing Derby. Now, if we went and, and gave them awards for chronologically gaming, I would say up to this point in 1981, the best audio visual effects I've ever seen for any video game thus far, well, for audio. Audio, I'd give it to Fantasy in the arcade. That had the best, it had 10 scenes. Each scene had a different soundtrack or a song that went with it with sound effects. So I'd say Fantasy had the best audio for best visual effects we've seen so far on the channel. The, the best looking game so far has got to be um, the in the arcade, the, some of the color vector graphics games for the best effects. Because uh, that's the one that's really, uh, I, I'd say, pushing the most. But I, but the scrolling we saw, like on Dino Wars on the Coco, was also really impressive. Or skiing on the Coco was really good. Yeah, Coco skiing. <laughs> And then they say the best solitaire game is Skiing by Activision. No, and you can see it right above my head. That one, uh, that, they're not using home computer for their uh, system. I thought they were using every electronic game. Not everything here. Best sports game, they say, in, in 1981 was Nazzle Soccer. That was the Intel and Television one, which uh, I would say so. It was a very good soccer game for the time. Best innovative game was Adventure. Fantasy gaming, ah, that's interesting. So they're saying Adventure was uh, out for 80 or 81, but uh, I'm pretty sure we saw it before, or at least in, in uh, my uh, my looking up of the release date for it. So uh, Arcade Awards were given to the best coin-op electronic game, Space Invaders 1, they said in 1980, 
and Asteroids took the prize in 1981, even though Space Invaders was released 78 and Asteroids was released in uh, 1979. Okay, so let's go after that, and now we go into Atari, and they're going to break down each one of the consoles and talk about the consoles. So this is kind of cool because, is it showing both? Okay, yeah. So this is going to first go through the Atari console, and th they have a whole write-up about the Atari VCS, what it's about, the origins and the whole, uh, just a brief overview of the library. So it is true, at this point, Atari is offering the largest game library. That killer app with Space Invaders gave them a lot, a lot of systems sold. So the VCS, the most popular programmable video machine in America, <laughs> they're saying, wait, oh, it didn't become it by accident. The console lacks glittery space and styling, makes up with rugged structure and logical design. There's no question the VCS is built to withstand the rigors of passionate play. Passionate play. That's what Atari's all about. And Atari is king. There's an example of Superman on the left, and on the right is uh, Missile Command. Very interesting that these aren't screenshots. These are, they, it looks like they created these uh, instead of taking a picture, because that is not to scale as what the Superman was. Very interesting. Yeah, that's true. If it was for 19, a uh, Donkey Kong, well, I know why. Donkey Kong was more popular and available in Japan right now. So this is uh, more of a North America uh, synopsis. Very good point. Because uh, worldwide, it should have been released by now, but maybe a lot of people haven't seen it in North America yet. But yeah, good point. Donkey Kong, I'm, I'm up there with that. All right, next they're going to give us some stats at, for the Atari VCS right now in 1981. Uh, Sunnyvale, California, where it came from. Right now, it's going for $200 for the Atari VCS in 1981 dollars. They have paddle, uh, joystick, and keypad that you can use, and we've seen all three of those on the channel. It uh, doesn't use a, a keyboard, but it says the keypad can be used, and it's true if you want to program using the keypads. Yikes. The sound source, interesting, is from the television, and I think the only reason they say that is because... To my knowledge, the RCA Studio 2 sound source came from the system itself. It didn't come from the television. They're saying right now there's 43 cartridges available for the Atari VCS. And the cartridge price is around $20 to $30. It has an AC adapter included. And, oh, the RF modulator. Who remembers that? The RF modulator to put, hook up to your CRT. It comes, it comes with it. And then they go about the popular titles about uh, with the Atari VCS. Space Invaders, Breakout, Missile Command, Asteroids. For game software, Space Invaders is the best home version of the single most popular coin-operated attraction of all time. Yes, I agree with you. And then they have Superman. Very impressive game going scene by scene. I wasn't able to figure it out. Me and my buddy, uh, uh, Digital Plug, uh, we, we didn't uh, do, it, do it as well. And I got a little berated for it and then ended up playing the back of myself, not live, and uh, had fun with it. And then we have Breakout, of course. Super Breakout's out now. It's the new hot one for the holidays. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. The original, uh, the 2600 modulator was very, very clunky. I agree with you. And then we have Missile Command, another really big one, very fun. We give it five stars here on the channel. And then Air Sea Battle. It was all right. It was pretty good uh, for a, what they call it, shooter game. There it is. Example in the bottom right corner with Breakout. And then we have our next section. They don't call it a console. They call Activision their own thing. So they're going to break down all the consoles that are available that you can have in North America, and then they give their own column for Activision. More games for the Atari. The first video game software company is what they say. So they say hardware is, of course, important, but Activision is unique. They know that everyone wants games, so that's all they do is make games. They've succeeded admirably. The California-based supplier is concentrating on pr producing cartridges for use with the Atari VCS. It started in mid-1980. Yep, that's right. And there we go. They have examples of tennis, which we've seen, fishing derby, freeway. And see, all these are not pictures. They are creating the, the game. These aren't screenshots of uh, of the system. Very interesting. And I'm guessing they had to do that to get something a little clearer, possibly, instead of having to take screenshots. And then, of course, we have boxing. Uh, excellent release. But I had to give a slight nod to Intellivisions. We saw it back to back. And during the console war, uh, television's boxing was amazing. And then Freeway, they talked about before, and Laser Blast. The commercial told us, oh, all those other space shooters, and they're not as good, but Laser Blast, that's where it is. And here at the bottom, we have an ad for the custom control with LE stick. What is LE? Le stick? 
XLE. A true joystick, too. Attractive hand grip. Uh, unfortunately, there's still a few bugs on the system. <laughs> so they're advertising the LE stick, but uh, there's some problems with it. Just ignore those. All right, as we scroll down, the next system they're going to talk about is the Fairchild. Yes, breathing new life into the Fairchild was Zircon. Uh, brings it back with the, uh, System 2, which we saw it advertised by Milton Burrell. Maybe they're, they're the ones doing the marketing for it. And they talk about the game software over on the far right side. There's Whizball and Slot Machine and Football. We've seen all these for the Fairchild. In fact, we saw the last game released this holiday season in 81. And I don't know if they talk about that one or not. <laughs> it was really hard to do photos. Yeah, I, I'm with you, L. Curtis B. Uh, and I can I can understand why they just made them uh, themselves. So here we go. Fairchild F at a glance. Uh, this is uh, 100 bucks or 70 bucks if you trade in another system. Interesting. It uses a joystick paddle combination. We're familiar with the, the controller. And then no keyboard, of course. Sound source is TV. But they were saying there's 24 cartridges for the Fairchild. And then they say it's uh, uh, 19 to $30 for the Fairchild cartridges. And then both are included with the uh, AC adapter and RF modulator. All right. And then next we have the Odyssey 2. Yes. The Odyssey 2 emphasizes sports and science fiction which they're giving that as a genre, which is interesting. I've never heard um, someone refer to a video game as a science fiction game. Maybe if a, a movie, of course. So they talk about the uh, Odyssey 2 system and game software, UFO, which we've seen, baseball, War of Nerves, very unique. Uh, I really enjoy War of Nerves. Computer Golf, Quest for the Rings is the newest of the five games. They keep gushing of Quest for the Rings, kind of like we did on the show. So here's the Odyssey 2 at a glance. This is $200 for the Odyssey 2. Uses a joystick, diaphragm keyboard, which is the spongy kind. Sound source is TV. They say there's 25 cartridges for the Odyssey 2 right now, and they go for about $20 to $60 for an Odyssey. I wonder if that's Quest for the Rings. I bet it was $60. And then the AC adapter and RF modulator are included, of course. And there's some examples that they're giving us. It kind of looks like they use construction paper for this. I want to know how they did that unless they uh, drew it themselves. All right, so next we have the Intellivision. Oh, yes. The Intellivision. And the games they go through here are, um, uh, looks like we got hockey, which I don't think we've uh, sh showcased hockey yet. We've seen basketball, soccer, and I don't think we've seen auto racing yet, but it will be showcased when we play the games that released at some point in 1981. We have uh, Space Battle, NBA basketball, auto racing, and auto racing is, is, is pretty cool to check out. So we'll, we'll see that one. And then we have the price is $300 right now. They use the keypad disc hybrid because they have the keyboard on top. Full stroke keyboard, not yet available. I wonder if they say they're going to be able to plug in a real keyboard and not the uh, chiclet spongy one. Uh, they, they say right now there's only 13 cartridges for the Odyssey 2. And this is very North America because the, the Philips Video Pack has more uh, for sure. They say they go for about 30 for the uh, uh, Intellivision. Sorry, not Odyssey 2. Intellivision. And then, um, yep, AC adapter and RF modulator there. And then the last one is the the Bally Professional Arcade or the Astrocade. Astrovision is what they call it. Professional Arcade System. For game software, they got Gunfight, Checkmate, uh, scribing sea wolf and missile and yes we've seen a few releases of those and we're going to see some more uh, as we close out 81 so which systems for you really cool guide they have here a little confusing so they talk about uh, all the systems vcs odyssey 2 and television channel f and look at that activision is lumped in with the other systems very interesting which one do you is the best system for you in 81 well if you were me just try to get them all if you got the money all right, so let's go to the next one. This is the Programming Parade. They are going to go over and over about Quest for the Rings and uh, how it works. And then they also talk about, um, yep, they're still going on about Quest for the Rings here. Yeah, it's the overall excellence of Quest for the Rings distinguished by the magnificent animation. During the first few games, more than one arcader will be tempted to surrender to the monsters just to watch them cavort across the screen. Quest for the Rings is quite simply the most innovatively designed video game of all time. Yeah, that's what Electronic Gaming says in 1981. And then they talk about Missile Command on, looks like the Atari, um, the Atari computer. And Kaboom, another really good one that we played uh, for the time. So um, 
This is just them talking about the details of it. The, and then auto racing for Intellivision goes in there too. <laughs> yeah, maybe now. Well, definitely in 84 or 85 when they were all in the bargain bin, right? Then you can get some great prices or from the yard sales and garage sales. All right, so this is giving us lots of details about the game and how they programmed them. Really cool stuff here for all the releases we've seen so far on the channel. And then it uh, goes to, yeah, even more, uh, even Video Whizball for the Fairchild, which I, I, I agree. That was the, one of the most innovative ones we played on the Channel F. And they go into uh, an ad for, ad for Video Magazine. Electronic Games, the first and only magazine devoted exclusively to America's fastest growing hobby playing electronic games. And I think we have all of them. We'll see all the releases of uh, electronic games. The next section is the computer section. And here it goes and breaks down one of my favorite games, Star Raiders. Uh, excellent game for the Atari home computer. And, and it goes into to, to that world. So this is going to see all the stuff from the computer world, which is kind of cool. We got the bowling, which we haven't seen yet. We'll, we'll be seeing that later in 1981 for the Atari home computer. And, oh yeah, the big bargain bins. If you've ever been to the Video Game Museum in uh, Dallas, Texas, they have uh, a, a recreation of the crash and bargain bins. Kind of interesting. And then they also talk about here a few games that, that were very hard to come by. Sands of Mars is another one. Try to look that one up. because Or here we go. House of Usher and Beneath the Pyramid. All three of these I didn't know existed before I did the channel. So but before I started uh, this channel, I thought I was ready and had the, the collection down. But no, after reading the magazines, there's games that were missed or forgotten about or lost. So th th there's there's three right there, really rare ones for the uh, Atari home computer. Like when, whenever you go to like Atari Mania, they don't even have dumps of uh, some of this stuff. And then yeah, Beneath the Pyramid, another one hard to find. This is the one that's really, really hard. Space Chase for the Atari home computer. It's, it's, it's like, I think it's lost unless someone uh, is able to g give us a dump for it. So the, the, these are games that we'll be seeing later in 1981, War at Sea, uh, Nomino's Jigsaw, and then the Adventure Number 7, Mystery Funhouse by Scott Adams and Adventure International. We'll be checking out those. We have seen Alien Rain on the Apple II on the far left side. That one's come up. Asteroid Field, I don't think we've seen that one yet, but we will. And then... Yes, even more for the computer. They have Empire of the Overmind. We checked that one out. And I believe, yes, Dino Wars. They have a, a column up for Dino Wars. Much appreciated. Love Dino Wars. It's awesome. And then here's a section for arcade fans, too. This magazine is awesome. It has everything. What's new in the arcades? So they have uh, Pleiades Root 16, Eagle, and Phoenix. And here they say it's pronounced Play at Ease. Play at Ease is how you pronounce it. Of course it is. I should have done that the first time. Pleiades. And then we have Space Odyssey. I believe we've seen that one already. Defender. Uh, Venture. Oh, we haven't seen that one yet. Exidy's Venture is fantastic. That one should be when we uh, check out the release at some point in 1981. That's a fun one. Yeah, Venture by Exidy. Warlords. We've seen that one in the arcades. Excellent. And there's the example of Venture and Warlords. Yeah, really excited for Venture. Tune in for that one for sure. Yes, they're somewhere. If uh, we can get them, let me know. Because as always, if you find games that are released at like an uh, earlier uh, time period, let me know because I'd like to showcase them. All right, so let's go to the next one. We have Lords of Karma, another really hard one to find for the uh, Apple II, Atari uh, 800, the Pet, and the TRS-80. Uh, we haven't seen that one yet, but we have seen Gorgon, a really cool Defender clone. And then Horse Racing, don't think we're going to see that one. It's literally just betting on Horse Racing. Space Trader for the Coco. Hey, there you go. Spectral Associates. There's a, a, a write-up on that one. We will be seeing that one at some point. Coming up soon. And then we have even Standalone. They have the handheld scene here too. Dark Tower. Challenges Adventurers. This is where the only time we're going to showcase and talk about Dark Tower. It is... Oh, here we go. This is, There's a better picture of it. Dark Tower is a video handheld that looks like that. It's like a mixture of board game and handheld. And then uh, on the far right side, we have Bank Shot, which we have seen on, on, on the channel. Uh, one of the first handheld pool games you could play. Really cool there. And then Alien Attack, there it is. That's the one we played last episode. Coleco's Alien Attack. I wonder if they had lots of marketing for this one. And as we scroll down, we have another one. This is 10 Pins, a bowling handheld you could play. This is the showcase we'll be doing for the channel for 10 Pins. There it is. Couldn't get another one of those to go. Same thing for Wildfire. 
Parker Brothers puts one in. That was, that's pretty cool. And then this next section is your own arcade game. Like spending the money on our arcade games, they're giving you the prices of what it would cost. Popular games cost between $2,000 and $3,000 new. So for all those really rich relatives, you give them the magazine and say, hey, for Christmas, can I have Targ? Can you imagine getting that and buying that and putting it in your home? It'd be so cool. And they're giving examples of the different uh, stand-up systems. And then there you go. There's the cost. Exidy's version of Targ right now is going for $1,275. That's awesome. Breakout's only 300 bucks. See, I mean, if that's the cost now, amazing. That uh, I wonder what's, what it's like whenever North America has the crash. Lunar Lander. Yeah, this is just fascinating. Uh, uh, look at this. Boot Hill, Starhawk. We've seen all these on the channel. Night Driver is 400 right now. Atari's football. The giant trackball football is 400 bucks for the whole arcade cabinet. Awesome. And then Lunar Lander in the arcade. Oh, Lunar Lander for your home computer. Okay, we haven't seen these versions yet, but we will. We'll see those. And then uh, Wildfire, Super Breakout. Okay, they're, they're continuing from the other articles, I see. So the strategy session, how to get good at Super Breakout. Yeah, it's telling you the strategy of how to play a Super Breakout. You, uh, the top four speed bricks double the speed of the ball when they're hit. So you concentrate on one side of the wall, directing the ball to the left or right, hitting it with the appropriate section of the paddle. Ah, oh, I see. <laughs> That's true. Unless you've seen that guy in Australia who has a full arcade at his at his home. He has like a a, a, a barn outside with a, a giant arcade. It's it's awesome. All right, so scrolling through, yeah, they're breaking a, a more of the standalone scene, and then here we go. Going to computer camp. Creative Computing has a computer day camp that you could go to. That would be up my alley for nineteen eighty one, sure. And then we have the video game clubs. You can see they have the Atari Game Club. If you want to be a member of that at the time in 1981, that's pretty cool. And then they talk about the IBM personal computer. Yep. Uh, going to be... Do, 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 do. Yep. And the IBM systems are going to range from $1,560 to $4,500 for a computer because of the power. And if you wanted 64K, it would be over $500 more than that. Wow. And then we also talk about Centipede here on this side. And as we scroll down, I'm just going to go uh, breeze through these a little faster. This one is uh, electronic football, comparing the football games between themselves. And then the handheld, the, uh, Mattel's newest handheld. Uh, their, their first football game was the second handheld they made. Very, very popular. And this is the newest one. This is world champion football in the palm of your hand with Coleco. Uh, doing a total programmable football game. Yeah, they're just taking that formula and going even uh, uh, more complicated with it. And the next part is um, the battling of the different chess games and which one's better, which one's more intelligent than each other. And here's one where you can actually get an arm to move the pieces for you. Uh, what is they have the cost for this one? $149? Wow. Yeah, there are lots of different versions of chess that you can play, some completely digital and some with pieces in, including, it uh, looks like Checkers over there too. Nice. Yeah, look at all that. So more Buyer's Guides, 1981, for all the, the chess and Checkers players. That's cool. And closing it out, they just talk about what's going to come next in electronic games. They're going to talk about the history of video games, 1982 arcade games, how video games are made. Watch the second issue of Electronic Games. And so we will. Whenever we get to 1982, we'll see the next issue. But in the meantime, this is where we'll stop our quest playing every single game and checking out the video game industry. We're going to be playing all the games released at some point in 1981 next time. Don't miss it and let me know what game have you not seen that should have come out in 1981 because we will play it. Thanks so much for watching. We will see you next time. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9pm Central, so join us and let us know if we miss any games along the way. This video would not be possible without RetroArch and LaunchBox. Please tell your friends there's some crazy guy out there trying to play every single video game. You can always check out Chronologically Gaming on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We will catch you next time.